The Sense of an Ending, the Booker Prize winning novel by Julian Barnes, follows a middle aged man who is confronted by people he knew in his youth and only to reconsider his understanding of his entire life. It's a book that's really easy to read in one sitting, but as soon as you finish it, you want to start over again. And then it lingers with you for a long time. Hello, and welcome to The Best Book Ever, the podcast where we get to know interesting people by asking them about their favorite book. I'm your host, Julie Strauss, and joining me today is Savan Hong, the author and illustrator of a lovely series of books featuring a cast of neurodiverse children. Savan told me today why she took up reading as an adult, why she finishes every book, even the hard ones, and why The Sense of an Ending is the best book ever. So I am a picture book author, and I write a series called The Super Fun Day Books, which is all about neurodiverse kids. So it's a book series that highlights kids with brain differences, so kids who have autism or ADHD or dyslexia, and it gives them the tools they need to kind of work through a challenging process. And I also illustrate my books. Um, and all of my books are designed specifically for that kind of audience. So the font is dyslexic friendly. The pictures are purposely um, very simple to keep to help kids with ADHD from staying focused on the story. And they're written in a structure called a social story, which is a tool used in special education that lays out a series of steps to help a child then be able to do what the story says. So that is my focus, which has nothing to do with the book we're reading. (laughs) What does uh, dyslexic friendly font mean? It's very simple. And the letters are spaced out more than a traditional font. Um, so no curly cues, no funny letters and, oh. and wide spacing. And so when you look at it, it, it doesn't look like a traditional children's book font. It really looks very simple, almost as if it's in draft, but that's the way a child with dyslexia can follow along with the, with the story. Because the curlier fonts make the letters sort of sp- What's mushed together, picture? right? Uh-huh. You want those letters to look as clean, as simple as if a teacher wrote them on the you know chalkboard as possible. And so, um, so when you look at my books, they will look different than a typical picture book because they are designed to be accessible for every kind of learner. But you know, what's interesting is that I went through and read them and Now I'm realizing I didn't catch the font thing at all. So the fact that they're accessible to kids with dyslexia does not make them unaccessible to neurotypical kids, right? Exactly. And interesting. um, Because all kids can read dyslexic friendly font. In fact, new readers, it may even be easier for them to follow along. Um, But I didn't design it specifically for new readers. I designed it to make sure that it would be inclusive to all of the different kinds of kids who'd be reading the books. And I have lots of kids who read them who are neurotypical um, Mm -hmm. because the story, you know, all kids feel anxiety and get nervous about things and, and the tools apply for everybody but they were purposely designed to be accessible for everyone. That is so cool. How, how do you know so much about this? Um, so I am neurodivergent myself. I have two kids who are neurodivergent. And um, the impetus for becoming an author for me was when my kids were really young, I couldn't find books that showed neurodivergent kids in a classroom setting. So kids wearing headphones or kids playing with fidget toys or highlighting the fact that that children like these really thrive from a schedule. And I wanted my kids, like we talk about with children's books, to have a mirror of their life so that they could feel normal um, and that they would understand that their experience wasn't unique and was okay. And so when I couldn't find these books, I said, I'm going to create these books 
so that other parents and teachers could have them and not have that same issue that I had, you know, with my son being like, why do I have to wear headphones? I don't want to be different. Um, and it's great because the feedback I get from parents and teachers, particularly parents who say their kid will point to the picture of the child wearing the headphones and say, oh, that's just like me. And that's what I wanted to be able to do. Oh, that's amazing. Have you, have your kids shared it like in their schools? Do they yeah. Share the teachers? The, the, all of the teachers that I name in the books, all the characters that are teachers are real teachers. Oh my and God. As my way of saying thank you to them for having such an incredible impact on the lives of my children. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> that makes me a little weepy. And so my kids have brought all of them a book and been like, this is you and thank you. And, and really, um, and right now they're at the, they're not teenagers yet. So they're still proud that their mom's a children's book author. At some point, everything I do will embarrass them, but we're not at that stage yet. (laughs) So were you always a reader? Tell me about your reading life. Um, no. In fact, it was my least favorite subject growing up because I didn't know I was neurodivergent as a kid, um, it, which is not unusual because women are or girls in particular are so wholly underdiagnosed and it manifests itself in very different ways um, in girls than it does in boys. And so nobody paid attention to it. And I was able to kind of get through school on a variety of do- other strengths. So nobody kind of raised it but I hated reading and I couldn't focus on what I was reading ever. Um, and then audiobooks became a thing. And I remember even in grad school spending $50 for a book on tape because that's how much they were back then. Yeah. Be- and, and the first one I read was War and Peace or Listen to, read, <laughs> Listen to. Um, because that was a book that was totally unaccessible to me. There was no way I was going to be able to get through it, right? And, <laughs> and I didn't want to do it using Cliff Notes, which is the way I got through high school. Yeah. But I wanted to really experience this book. Um, and I loved it. And then from then on, every book, uh, that's how I consume books. And, and everything is an audio book. And I even made my own, audio, my own children's books available as audio books because there are so many kids out there that that's the way they consume reading. And I use that word kind of like reading at, as a way to consume a book and not literally with your eyes. Because mm-hmm. I tell my kids, I'm like, you don't tell somebody who reads with braille that they're not reading because they're not using their eyes. So there's no reason to think that because you're using your ears to read, you're not reading, you're still reading. It's just Mm. how you consume it. So uh, now that there's, you know, audible and I can get these memberships and whatever, it, it has opened up a whole new world of literature for me. And had it been around, you know, 20, 30 years ago, I would have been an English major because I love it. <laughs> God. Where okay, so you dove into <laughs> War and Peace. <laughs> <laughs> the most intimidating book I think in all of written language. So I'm already blown away. But tell me where you went afterwards when you realized, "Oh, I really am a reader. I just finally found my format." Did you just go on a wild spree and pick up horror, erotica, you know, like, did you go everywhere or did you kind of find your genre immediately? Um, Originally, at the time I was in graduate school, I was doing a doctorate in international relations and I focused just on histories, right? All these incredible biographies that again, were not accessible to me before because they're, you know, a thousand pages and full of you know, great details that I would have missed. And so that's where I focused my attention. And then only when I had kids, did I really get into kind of classical literature and and novels. And for me, it's, you know, I go back and I'll read Steinbeck and be like, wow. And, you know, my husband who happened to have been an English major laughs at me because I'm like, this is such a great book. And he's like, yes. (laughs) <laughs> yes, honey, it is. And I forced him to talk to me about it and kind of go back in time from when he read it. And 
And so I'll go back to the classics. And then I also look at the books that, um, you know, are getting the Nobel Prize in literature, or the Booker Prize, or the, and I'm reading all of them voraciously. And that's my love, right? Like, I don't read mystery books. I don't read romance books. I love all of the stuff that I hated when I was a kid. And I think part of the reason that I love it so much now is because I could never appreciate it back then. And so it's like filling this gap of all the stuff that I missed. Do you remember how you came across this book that we're talking about today, The Sense of an Ending by Julian Barnes? Um, It was on some list that I looked at um, and that it was like, here are some great books. And so um, it, I use Goodreads and I make my like to read lists and I jump back and forth between classics and books that are more modern. Mm-hmm. Um, and I came across this book and it blew me away. Um, I can't say I have a favorite book, but it's definitely up there on, on, kind of the top of my list. Can you tell my listeners what it's about? It's a short book. It's about 150 pages. So maybe it's a novella, but um, it's about a guy named Tony and it it's broken up into two parts. The first part of the book is him remembering his life as a teenager and his circle of friends and, um, and one of his friends in college or post-college commits suicide and how he kind of remembers that experience. And then it jumps the second part of the book, which is the meteor part of the book actually jumps in time to when he's in his sixties and, um, and his, this friend whose name um, is Adrian's diary is brought out. Um, and he wants to get a hold of it and understand why his friend committed suicide. This was something that he never rested with. And so the book goes back and forth between kind of Tony remembering what his childhood was like and the things he believed as a teenager and a college student and how that kind of conflicts with the way he views the world as an adult. Um, and so to me, what made it so powerful is I feel like it's a book that sucks you in within the first kind of page. And there's a mystery, right? You're trying to understand why his friend committed suicide. And so you want to know more, but it's full of language um, that is so beautiful and is, um, and it's full of philosophy and it's, the philosophy is not used in this kind of, listing a bunch of philosophers to make the author look smart, but really trying to make you question kind of what you believe about humanity and life. And it's done in such a beautiful way. Tell me what you think of the title, because this is a book to me that you close it and you realize the circular nature of the book. And I feel like I have this weird vision in my head that this book is a circle because the second it ends, you flip back to page one. And I love that title, the sense of an ending, because you have no real sense of the ending. No, I don't I think, didn't. right. I don't, I don't feel like the book actually ends, mm-hmm. right. The, the author leaves you with so many questions um, and, you know, Does Tony really understand who his friend Adrian was? Do you really know what actually happened? Like there is a closure. There is an ending because the words stop, but the story doesn't actually stop. And and you're left thinking about what you just read for days and days and days. The, The end of this book, when he realizes he misunderstood everything, I'm 52. So I'm at a point in my life where I look back on so many things or people say things, remember this from childhood. And it always happens that they remember it so differently than I do. Or I did not get at all what was happening in that situation. I didn't see anything. And I'm not just talking about when I was eight. I'm talking about like when I was 30. (laughs) (laughs) Actually, I think it's worse when you're 30, right? Like your perception of, of the world to me. So the, the, 
the book takes place when he's a teenager and a college student um, is supposed to take place in the 60s. But his angst about growing up and who he is and what the world holds, I think is so universal. Mm -hmm. Julian makes the character of Tony so relatable and so vulnerable. You feel like you know him. Um, and, And every little bit of his world comes to life. And so, yeah, it brings you back to like, well, how did I view the world in college? And and what does time really mean? And how, you know, because I'm 48 and like you, it's like, yeah, life looks very different. Um, And the way I think about time is so different. And so I found it to be so relatable and this whole notion of 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 looking back and and being like, wow, was I really like that? Did I see the world this way? And did I say those things or think those things? Um, so it for because the book is so chock full of philosophy, it forces you to self-reflect as you're going along. Like I feel as if you self-reflect with the main character as he's mm. questioning these things, you question those things. Um, and what's so brilliant to me is that you're going through this kind of philosophical questioning of your life while you're reading this short book that pulls you in and you can't put it down and you don't realize that that's the power of the book, right? You don't understand it until you close the book. And then again, that's where the irony and the brilliance of the title of the book comes to fruition because it doesn't actually end. It has this impact on you as a person. Which is exactly the way it happens in life, where you get this flash of understanding that resets the entire beginning, where I go, oh my God, you know, that that was something else I was seeing. And it changes your entire beginning. And this book, I kind of thought, I wonder if people miss the end. It was pretty subtle that, and we're not going to do spoilers here. So don't worry, listener, you don't need to. to (laughs) I'm trying to be careful not to give too much away. Yeah. I think that that, that's true, but I think the only way that the, that Julian Barnes could have done it would be subtly because Mm -hmm. if he made the ending hit you in the face and be strong, then it would actually be a real ending and you could put the book down and walk away. And I don't, I think the power is the subtlety of it. Um, and you and I have both read it twice, right? And so we we can see the buildup and we can see what's happening, but there is no other way to end it, to have the kind of impact, I think. How are you such a good reader, given that you didn't take it up and you weren't an English major? And I mean, good reader in the sense of, um, really being able to pick up on themes and, and layers and things like that. I mean, you're kind of disproving that you have to have an English literature major <laughs> to understand a book, right? So how do you, how did you build up that muscle? I think I just, it, it feels like a missed opportunity because I love it so much. Like I have an audiobook going on uh, almost all day long. I'm, I'm, you know, if I'm going to the supermarket, there's an audiobook on. I'm probably the least friendly person in the world because I always have like my earbuds in. But you know, I'm folding laundry, whatever. I, I just can't get enough of it. And so, um, to me, it's just such pleasure. And when I hear some of the sentences, and you know, I, you have to pause and you take in, and you're like. I can't believe somebody wrote that. Like the beauty and the the perfection of that sentence blows my mind. And so it's just something that I am profoundly drawn to. Again, like I I missed a career. You know, I should have been an English (laughs) professor instead of political science or a business professor, which I ended up becoming um, because there's so much beauty in these books. And even the books that are hard to get through. Uh, I'm one of these people who finishes every book and, and, and I'm, and I'm surprised because books that start off being 
you know, really hard to get through end up just, you're like, oh, that work was so worth it. And, and one of the books, the book I'm reading right now is called the book of Jacobs and it's 900 pages of very, very heavy, difficult writing, even though it's been translated and, um, and the first three quarters of the book, I'm not completely done, but the first three quarters of the book, I was just like, what's happening? <laughs> like, I need to get to the meat. Like, what, what is this author trying to tell me? And now I'm getting to the point where things are starting to kind of open up. And books are one of these things. They're such an analogy to life that like, if you work hard and you get through something that's really hard that accomplishment is going to give you this incredible gift. And I feel like books are so like that. You're making me rethink my entire life philosophy. (laughs) Because I am the opposite. Honestly, being three quarters of the way through a 900 page book and not understanding, I would have given, well, I would have given up by a quarter of that book. I would have gone, this one's not for me, but I understand what you're saying. That's true. Everything of value in my life came through work. Everything. Yeah. But I I quit books at the drop of a hat. No, I I never, I have not yet regretted it. I've not yet regretted it. And look, there are some books that I like more than others. But the books that are hard, those are the ones that end up having such incredible results. Well, okay. Oh, okay. You said there are books that you like more than others. Do you ever read a book that you genuinely dislike? Would you stick with that? Yeah, I still read it. I would still read it. And I'm like, I hate this author. I hate this character. I don't think this is relatable. Like, why do people like this book? Sure. There are books that I don't like but I will read them all the way through because how can I have that opinion if I haven't actually given it the shot, right? Like what if it has this magic ending that's Uh going to make it amazing? But usually the books I don't like are not the books that are hard to read. There's just something about the way the character is or the way the author views the world or whatever that doesn't jive with me. But those are not the books that are hard to read. Like the book of Jacobs is hard to read, but I'm starting to realize why. And, and there was no other way of doing it besides making it so hard to read. Like that is kind of unlocking all of these different layers that the author has spent 600 pages laying out for you, right? Like then you start unlocking it, but you needed those 600 layers to make that magic. Otherwise it would have been, or 600 pages, then it would have been just, you know, three pages and it would have been like, oh, okay. You know, it wouldn't be the work of art that it is. Tell me what that book is. I've never heard of that. It's book called the book of Jacobs. Um, and it, it, it's very kind of abstract. I think that it took the author seven years to write it because she did so much research. And it is about um, this guy in 1700s in Poland who starts off being a religious Jew and thinks of himself as a messiah. And it, it goes very deep into what it meant to be a Jew back then. And um, anti-Semitism and the roots of anti-Semitism. But the story is really about this guy who's, you know, supposed to be the next Messiah, but it's written as I think it's seven or eight different books. And the books are written from somebody else's perspective about their same experience at that moment in time and their interactions with this Messiah guy named Jacob. Um, And so you get the view from a priest, you get the view from, you know, one of his followers, you get all of these different views. And, and so you keep reliving the same story over and over and over again, but from different angles. Um, And, and so, yes, there are parts that are very, very, you know, learning about all of 
Jewish mysticism, which is a big part of the book and things like that. Um, some of that stuff is hard to get through, but, and, and I'm Israeli. So some of those, like, I know those words, um, but, um, but just this, the, the novelty of, you know, you're looking at something from nine or what, I, I don't know how many chapter, how many books there are, cause I haven't finished it, but like from nine different books, from nine different perspectives at the same time, very unique perspectives. And then you're starting to get a view of what reality is, right? Uh-huh. Because everyone's perspective is different and everyone's view of what matters to include in their book is different. And they're all deliberately writing the book. So it's not that you're just getting it from a character's perspective. Yeah. You're getting it from these nine different authors um, and how what they choose to include and what they choose to not include. And, and so you're really starting to hone in on what the truth is. And, and you don't know that yet, right? Because until you get to the end of the book, you don't really know because you've only seen it from a couple of different perspectives. I can't help but notice what an incredible companion that is to the sense of an ending. It's like this book that you're reading is like you are going through the entire pie and it really makes you realize how much this Julian Barnes book is one person's little sliver of the pie. And again, the end of the book, you realize there is so much else I don't know. Everyone else has their version of this story. And even though I've sort of understand this guy a little, and I see how little he understands, I don't know anybody else's tale. It's it's right. really interesting the parallel between those two story structures, isn't it? It is because it, it and I did not do that on purpose, but because this just happens to be the book that I'm reading <laughs> right now. Um, but it really gets you to question what perception is right? Mm -hmm. Like what is reality and, and how do you figure out that the, that kind of the granularity of what truth is. Mm -hmm. And in, in the Julian Barnes book and the sense of an ending, that is why um, I think the character is so appealing because you watch him with all his flaws and he's very flawed human. Um, You watch him with all his flaws and his vulnerabilities start getting closer to the truth and you feel him recognize that as he gets closer and you feel the sense of how uncomfortable he is as he gets closer because his 20 year old self was able to make a very clean truth of why his friend committed suicide and it was easy and he could move on but that's not the truth and so really coming to terms with the fact that the truth you knew is not the true truth. Mm -hmm. You feel his pain in this book. And, and I think when an author can do that, it's incredibly powerful. What's amazing to me is so many books that are so heavily steeped in philosophy can be hard to get through. And he makes this so easy. You don't feel like somebody is sitting there talking to you about your view on humanity and your view on time and all of this stuff, because he kind of just, everything's in the voice of Tony and Tony's this flawed guy that it doesn't feel like you're being preached to. I think for a while, I kept reading all these books that kept mentioning Proust. And I'm like, why does every book mention Proust? And I'm like, (laughs) I was so happy this book did not mention Proust because I felt like it, it doesn't, without there's no pretension to it right because the character is so <laughs> flawed and kind of whatever there it it you you don't realize it's happening that's me being snotty <laughs> no that's the best description in fact that would be something that it's a book i would like to pass on and that's something you could say is it doesn't mention proust you're okay <laughs> <laughs> I, I literally i think i had like five books in a row and i remember saw in my head and i'm like Please, <laughs> authors need to stop mentioning Proust. We don't all need to talk about Proust. <laughs> now, have you read Proust? You probably have. I have part of um, um, my graduate studies because 
Um, they were in international relations and political science. I had to read a lot of political philosophy and a lot of philosophy and, and so fairly well versed um, in all of that stuff and, and do enjoy it. But I just, I feel like sometimes authors will just drop in those names to make themselves <laughs> feel like they're more intellectual than they are. And, and, and it doesn't add to the story, right? Like, I don't mind if you put all that stuff in, if it, if it does something, but just to put it in, to put it in. And I'm like, no, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> my daughter is at university and she had to read a lot of Proust last year. And she said, mom, what do you know about Proust? And I was like, yeah, yeah. You know, the Madeline cookie. And she said, my professor says that if all they bring up is the Madeline cookie, that means they haven't read it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm kind of fixated on your on your very admirable determination to get through a book. And I want to know, where do you go for an absolutely unchallenging, fun read? What, what do you consider your sort of pleasure, purely pleasurable reading? So um, Ann Patchett has all of these mm. kind of short stories that were her essays and, and are her, you know, are autobiographical and I eat them up, right? Like I feel like I'm talking to a friend and, mm. um, and those to me are like, I would, I devour everything that she puts out. So that's my happy, fun read. That does not shock me at all because <laughs> there is an elegance to her books that is so like Julian Barnes. Because mm -hmm. there's so many dimensions. Mm -hmm. The same thing. You realize you're getting a slice. You're getting a slice. And, and in her kind of short essay compilations that she puts out, there's a vulnerability to her. Like you, she's not trying to project who she wants the world to see her as, mm -hmm. but it really feels as if she's just trying to talk to a friend. Right. And you feel like, you know, her um, in a way that so many authors who try to write that way almost have a wall up, but she doesn't like, it feels like you could walk into her bookstore and, you know, give her a hug. And mm -hmm. obviously you can't because <laughs> you don't know her. But um, I bet people do, though. I bet people because she just has that kind of way about her. Um, and she writes about writing and she writes about um, about the challenges of being an author. And she writes about the challenges of being a woman. And and um, and she's just so relatable. Right. There's no. There's nothing pretentious about her. You see her failures, you see her successes. You know, one of her stories was about her trying to become a detective in Los Angeles to write kind of an undercover story. And her father was a detective in the Los Angeles Police Department and her trying out to get into um, the police academy and what that physical workout was like. And there's just like, this way that you're like, yep, I can totally see all of this happening. And <laughs> when we, we talked earlier about this notion of truth and I feel like her books are full of it, mm. right. That there isn't that questioning about, am I just perceiving something, which of course we are, because we're just seeing it from her perspective, but it feels so truthful. Have you been to her bookstore? I haven't, but it's definitely on my list of to do's because even her story about why she founded it and um, and this beauty of supporting independent bookstores and all of that, I, it really, you know, as authors, it speaks to our souls. It just does. What's your favorite indie bookstore? Well, I actually there. I live in Westport, and Westport has a relatively new, I think it's a little bit over a year old um, bookstore that's a used bookstore. And all, all of the people who work in it are people um, who have disabilities. And all of the books that go into the bookstore are donated. Um, and the money that gets raised goes to support the Westport Public Library. And when you walk in, it is such a magical place because 
you see these multiple missions kind of joining together, it really, to me, is kind of the perfect place. And so I try, um, I try, I donate a lot of my signed copies of books to them. Um, and, and I do book readings there whenever I can, because my population of kids, some of them will grow up to work in that bookshop. Will you share with my listeners where they can find you and your work? Absolutely. So um, the benefit of being the only Savan Hong in the world is that, <laughs> um, and I am the only Savan Hong in the world, um, is that my um, website is savanhong.com and it's S is in Sam, I, B is in Victor, A, N is in Nancy, H-O-N-G.com. All my books are available there. They're also available on Amazon um, and they're in a bunch of uh, local bookshops kind of all over the country. So you can find them there as well. Well, I want to thank you for joining me today. This was so fun. And I love this book so much. And I hope you will come back anytime you have a book you want to share with me, because this has been a delight talking to you, although I'm not reading a 900 page book. I'm telling yeah, you that right don't now. Do, don't do it. Don't, <laughs> I, I personally love it. Um, and every person that I've recommended it to look at me like I'm crazy. But um, <laughs> Okay. Well, <laughs> when you come back, I mean, there better be like you, if that's the book you choose when you come back, you're going to I won't to do okay. that to you, Julie. <laughs> okay. Fair. All right. I will go through and like all the books that I read in the next year, I will find a good one that we can talk about. And then I will email you and I'll say, I found a good book. It's not 900 pages long. Let's talk again. <laughs> and you will understand it. Those are my only requirements. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Excellent. And it won't have any Proust. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm in. I already love it. <laughs> Come on, this has been great. Thank you so it's much. It's so nice talking to you. I feel like I made a friend. <laughs> Bookworms, this conversation was not only one of my most fun interviews, but also one of the most thought-provoking. Savant's commitment to sticking with books in order to understand them really had me reconsider my stance, which is quit early and quit often. I would love to hear your approach. What's your policy on finishing books? Tell me over on Instagram at Best Book Ever Podcast. Remember, you can find links to all the books we discussed in the show notes or at my website, bestbookeverpodcast.com. And if you have a book you want to tell me about, click on the Be a Guest button on my website or Instagram bio so we can chat. Thank you for joining me today, and I will see you at the library. <laughs> <laughs>